You can afford anything, but not everything. Every choice that you make is a trade-off against something else. And that doesn't just apply to your money. That applies to your time, your focus, your energy, your attention, anything in your life that's a scarce or limited resource. Saying yes to something implicitly means saying no to all other opportunities. And that opens up two questions. First, what matters most? Second, how do you align your decision-making with that which matters most. Answering these two questions is a lifetime practice, and that is what this podcast is here to explore and facilitate. My name is Paula Pant. I am the host of the Afford Anything podcast. And today, we're going to talk to Ryan Holiday about courage. Best-selling author Ryan Holiday is known for his writing on Stoic philosophy. He has gained massive popularity with his books, The Ego is the Enemy and The Obstacle is the Way amassing about half a million followers on Twitter, which is not something a lot of philosophers can say. Today he joins us to discuss courage, not physical courage, not the acts of valor that we read about in inspiring headlines. Those acts are important too, but today's discussion centers around moral courage, doing what is right, particularly when it comes at a cost. This is a concept that we can apply to every facet of our lives, from the way that we make decisions about our money, our businesses, our careers, our relationships, our families. Anything that matters will require moments of moral courage. And to explore what that means and how to develop that, we talk to Ryan Holiday. Before we get into this conversation, I have one, two quick announcements both of which I will elaborate on at the end of the show. The first is that in the next two weeks, I will be live streaming three times, including live audience Q&A, to discuss some of the most common questions and fears around real estate investing. So if you live in a high cost of living area, if you're wondering if this year is a good time to start given the market currently, if you're not sure how this type of investing plays into your financial independence timeline. Those are the concepts that I will be live streaming about, and you can sign up for free at affordanything.com slash real estate. That's announcement number one. Announcement number two is that I offer a course, 10 weeks long, very high touch. We give our students a lot of support. It's a course on real estate investing. We only open our doors twice a year. This is the last time we're opening our doors this year. If you are interested, go to affordanything.com slash VIP list. The deadline is October 14. We close our doors at that point and they will not be open again for the rest of the year and for about probably another five or six months. So again, that's affordanything.com slash VIP list. With those two announcements out of the way, we turn our attention to Ryan Holiday for this discussion on moral courage. Hi, Ryan. Hi, how are you? I am fantastic. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Great. You recently wrote a book called Courage is Calling. It's about the importance of courage. This is not a concept that most people in the day-to-day world necessarily think of. It tends to be a heroism and courage and bravery tend to be concepts that we think of in specific contexts. How does, broadly speaking, a concept like courage apply to the average person who's listening to this episode right now? Well, that's a really good point. We do tend to think of courage as like, well, I'm not a soldier or, you know, I don't run into burning buildings to to save people because that's not my job, right? We think of courage either in like the military sense or or basically what we we tend to think of physical courage. When we Mm. hear that word, we we think physical acts of bravery. But of course, there's always been two domains of courage that they call physical courage and moral courage. Moral Mm. courage being, you know, standing up to your boss, uh, blowing the whistle uh, on something you've seen, sticking to your beliefs. But At the core, all forms of courage, whether it's physical or moral or some combination of the two, it's really about a willingness to put your your butt on the line, 
right? Like whether it's for someone else or it's for something you believe in, whether it's putting up money to bet on something like a, a business idea that you have, or it's about trying something that, that most people think will fail. To me, courage is that. It's the willingness to risk something for something. And I think it's if you see it as sort of simple and as boiled down as that, it becomes more clear why we need this in the course of our life, whoever we are, whatever it is that we do professionally. How do we know when we are being courageous versus when we are not? How do we develop the self-awareness? Number one, to recognize that the circumstance calls for it, which may not be readily apparent. And number two, to self-assess whether or not we have risen up to the task. Well, not to get too deep into it, but I think it's even trickier than that, right? How do you know if you are sure you are being courageous? How are you sure you're being courageous for the right thing? Mm. You could be immensely selfish. There's a there's a story about a Spartan warrior who, in the middle of this battle, he rips off his armor and he fights even without armor. And when he comes back, instead of the being thrown a parade or, you know, they put a statue up of him, he's actually fined by the city's elders for being reckless, mm. for endangering a Spartan asset unnecessarily. And that's just like a more simple example. What if what if someone is courageously fighting for an unjust cause? Mm. So I get all of which is to say this book is actually the first book in a four book series that I'm doing. And it's on the what they call the cardinal virtues being the, the core virtues of Stoic philosophy. Courage is the first virtue, but the next virtue is self-discipline, and the third virtue is justice, and the fourth virtue is wisdom. And the point is all of these virtues fit inextricably with each other. They're difficult to separate. So you know, we're talking about courage, and we can really talk about what courage looks like and what it means, but it's impossible to separate courage from wisdom, which mm -hmm. goes to your question is, how do I know I'm being courageous? And then it's, that's impossible to separate from justice, which is how do I know that I'm being courageous about the right thing? And then the, the final part is how do I know that I'm expressing the right amount of courage, not too much, not too little. And so this is really a difficult challenge to do, but it's why we have to be thinking about it consciously. We can't just sort of, oh, I'm just going to trust my gut on this. In the absence of trusting your gut, what are the other options? Well, there's a story I tell in the book that I, I like, just go to this point of trusting your gut. Theodore Roosevelt is president, and he decides to invite Booker T. Washington to dine at the White House with him, the first time that an African-American has been invited to dine at the White House. Obviously, they've been in the White House, they've built the White House, but they've never been invited to dine as the guest of a president. And Booker T. Washington is, is the most well-known African-American figure in the country at that time, and the civil rights leader and, and uh, uh, just a, a wonderful human being. And as Theodore Roosevelt is considering this, thinking about inviting him, he says he gets this moment of hesitation. He thinks about what this means for his reelection prospects. He thinks about his southern relatives. He thinks about just what the newspapers are going to say. So he's he's he has this moment of hesitation. But he says that actually it was precisely because he hesitated that he knew he needed to do it. He said he felt sick and ashamed of himself that he even considered those reasons for not doing it. And that's why he did it. Is this a hard and fast rule? You should only do what you felt a hesitation to do? No, because sometimes the hesitation is what's saving you from needlessly plunging off a cliff. But I do think this idea of, okay, the things that we're afraid of, we're often afraid of them because there's that voice in our head that's saying, well, what about this? And what about this? And do you really want to get into this? And that's, that is the voice of cowardice in our head that we need to sort of push through or power through. I loved that story in the book. And the thing that struck me when I read the letter that Teddy Roosevelt wrote was that when he felt that hesitation, not only did he feel ashamed that he felt it, but he hastened, he actually hastened to do it. Yes. And, and I think he says, and that's how, why I knew it needed to happen, not just for himself. This wasn't just a like, oh, I'm a glutton for punishment. I'm going to do it even though I'm going to get criticized for it. I think he realized that because it would be controversial and that people would be frustrated that he did it or 
it struck him as why it was the just and proper thing to do, that this was exactly what the country needed, what what needed to happen. Now, look, was Theodore Roosevelt perfect on the issues of race? Absolutely not. Did he make a whole bunch of other mistakes? Uh, did he hold a number of beliefs that we would today think of as as not just regressive, but outright racist? Yes. So I, I don't want to make it seem like he was somehow a perfect person. But in this one instance, he does not allow that sort of voice that, well, what will happen if deter him from doing what was obviously the right thing to do? And in the example that you just mentioned, it sounds as though the concept is that rather than trust his gut, he valued principle over gut or valued principle over voice of doubt. Yes, that's right. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine who has a big podcast and he was talking about there's all these issues happening in the world and you know that not everyone is on the same page about them. And mm -hmm. so you try to talk about what you talk about and you go, OK, but if I talk about this, this other thing that's important to me that's happening in the world that I feel obligated to speak up or out about there's a certain amount of my audience who's not going to be interested in that. There's a certain uh, amount of my audience who's going to be upset by that. And you can have very strong business reasons for not doing mm -hmm. a thing. To not do something because you're afraid of it costing you money is a really bad reason. In fact, there's a great expression I love that says, um, it's not a principle if it doesn't cost you money, mm -hmm. right? So like, when we think about courage, if it wasn't scary, if the outcome was obvious, like if Theodore Roosevelt knew for certain that it wouldn't cost him the election, that it would age well historically, that it wouldn't cause a bunch of drama or difficulty, if starting the business was a guarantee, if success was guaranteed, well, then it wouldn't require courage and doing it wouldn't be courageous. So the fact that these things are scary or hard, there's a show my son likes, and they have this song where they talk about, you have to be scared to be brave. And I remember hearing that as I was writing the book and thinking, that's actually very well said, right? Like if you're not scared, if it was obvious, um, if there was no risk involved, then bravery is just not a part of this equation. Speaking of being scared, one of the concepts that you write about in the book is the notion of fear. And it's, it's interesting because you talk at a biblical level about be not afraid, but also fear the Lord and, and how those are apparent contradictions until you dig into them and then you discover that they're not. And, and that can be applied not just to Christian doctrine, but in a variety of universal contexts. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. And I, I'm saying that from the perspective of someone who's an agnostic. I think it is interesting to see that be not afraid is like the most repeated phrase in the Bible. And it's also a repeated phrase in the Odyssey. And so much of literature is about the idea of not being afraid. And yet the Bible also talks about, you know, fearing the Lord. And so what is that? I think, you know, you talked about principle earlier. What Theodore Roosevelt was actually afraid of was not the chatter of the newspapers. It was letting himself down or in his case, not being like one of the people from history or even his own family who he admired and strived to be like. So I think that's an important part. When we think about fear or when we think about things we're afraid of, we are often afraid of the consequences, right? Like, well, will this be bad for me? What will this cost me? What will people say about me? But we seem to be less afraid of like, well, how will history judge me in the future? Or how will I feel about myself in the future? The excuse, well, I was afraid, does not age well. Not just with other people, but with ourselves. When you look back at the things that you didn't do because you were afraid, because you thought of the consequences, because you were putting your safety first, very rarely are you like proud of yourself. You're like, I'm so glad I chickened out, right? Um, you think instead, what was I so afraid of? That's so ridiculous. The risk was so minimal. And yet I deprive myself of X, Y, or Z, or I embarrassed myself, or, or worse, I brought shame to myself. I did the wrong thing instead of taking the opportunity to do the right thing. So I think the tension between be not afraid and fear the Lord is don't be afraid. 
you don't need to be afraid. There's there's a plan, right? But the other part of it is if you're going to be afraid of anything, be afraid of falling short. Be afraid of not living up to what you're capable of or what is expected of you. Can you talk, since we are talking about fear, can you talk about the concept of cowardice? How do you define it and how do we recognize it both in ourselves and in situations? Cowardice is not fear, right? Mm -hmm. Cowardice is not fear because fear is just being afraid. What matters is like it becomes cowardice when the action you take is about that fear, right? Mm -hmm. So I heard a great definition of cowardice is that cowardice is when out of fear we fail to do our duty. So like I don't like roller coasters and I don't like heights. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a coward for not jumping out of an airplane on my birthday every year to parachute down, right? I'm, a, I'm not a coward for not skydiving because there's no reason for me to skydive, right. right? Now, if there was something on the line that I needed to do that for and I didn't do it because I was afraid, that would be different. I don't enjoy the sensation of, you know, my stomach dropping, so I don't seek out roller coasters. That's that's not cowardice. But let's say I was writing this book or one of my other books and I was pulling my punches. I wasn't saying what I really thought because I didn't want to offend people or I was not sharing things that I knew or felt because I was worried what someone might think or um, I was trying to present myself a certain way that would be cowardice, right? Because my duty, my job as an author is to put myself out there. The, the, the job of the book is to be the expression of what I think and feel. And so if out of cowardice, I fail, if out of fear, I fail to do that, then we would call that cowardice. You also talk about how fear's other identity is shame. Can you elaborate on that? Well, what do we fear most, I think, you know, other than death or perhaps even more than death? There's a great Jerry Seinfeld line about how we'd rather be in the casket than delivering the eulogy at a funeral because mm -hmm. we fear public speaking more than death. I think at the core, what we fear more than anything is what other people will think. So at the root of so many moments of cowardice in our own lives and in history was really this not wanting to be rejected, not wanting to be laughed at, not wanting to be seen as different or unusual. So again, when we talk about physical or moral courage, of course, to be a Navy SEAL requires all sorts of courage. We're very lucky to have those people in the world. But there is another part of courage, which is just to be different in a world where there's a lot of pressure to be like everyone else. You know, so the courage to march to the beat of your own drummer, to be different, to be difficult, to be unique, to insist on what you like, what you think, what you need is really, really important. I would guess the I would say the other part where shame and, and courage are interrelated is perhaps counterintuitive, but also the courage to ask for help, to be vulnerable to speak up when you are struggling. Courage is not being invincible and not having vulnerability or weakness either. But what prevents us from saying like, hey, I'm having trouble or I don't know or I can't do this, I need help. What prevents us from doing these seemingly you know, minor, ah, m making these minor statements compared again to running into a burning building, is we're really afraid of being judged. Mm. And so how can a person develop bravery? How can a person start in an actionable way to be less afraid or to perform acts of courage in spite of their fear? Well, I think we can start with, and, and the way I try to build this book and all my books is about studying people who were courageous. There's a Longfellow poem and he says, you know, the lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime. I love the idea of like, who are your heroes? Who do you admire? Who do you look up to? Whose example are you following? I think that's a really important part. And it can be easy 
to look around and see, you know, everyone else sort of not ruffling feathers, nobody else standing up, nobody else doing anything and be like, okay, I don't, I'm not obligated to do anything here. I don't have to do anything. But when you have steeped yourself in the history and examples, when these sort of characters that I build the book around are real and true to you, you feel called to follow in their footsteps. And I think that was something I thought a lot about during the pandemic. One, it was wonderful to be able to live with and and talk to these figures from Florence Nightingale to Winston Churchill um, to the 300 Spartans, you know, as I'm writing the book. But remembering that, hey, as difficult as the, the last 18 months have been, you are by definition the direct descendant of people who survived much worse, right? We come from a long, unbroken chain of evolutionary success stories. We wouldn't be here without being descended from people who uh, survived the Spanish influenza and survived uh, World War II and survived the Great Depression and survived all the way back to the Antonine Plague, which Marcus Aurelius lived through. We are the descendants of generations of survivors. And I think sort of seeing yourself as an heir to a tradition as opposed to just some ordinary person from from Phoenix, you know, who's uh, nothing special is an important way to to sort of reframe sort of who you are and, and what what you're obligated to do. At the risk of being overly analytical, is there any way to quantify this? To quantify courage? Yeah, courage, bravery, any of these concepts. We've been talking about concepts at a high level. Many, particularly this audience, there are many people who love spreadsheets, live in them. That's their, sure. that's their love language. Is there any way to, to track, to manage, to in any way quantify improvement in these domains? I don't know. I mean, one of the things I do talk about is I don't want you to think of courage as this all or nothing thing. Mm -hmm. Like I am courageous or conversely, which I imagine a lot of people do, they go, I'm not courageous mm. because I failed here or there. I now see myself as a coward or a scared or, or whatever. I think a better way to think about it is like more often than not, what do you do? Do you go towards the fear or do you go away from the fear? You know, there's that cliche, like do one thing every day that scares you. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a cliche, but it's a pretty good rule, right? Like, so if you want to think about quantifying it, it's like, how are you challenging yourself on a daily basis? What is the thing that you are doing that is getting you out of your comfort zone, that's preparing you, that's building this, this muscle of courage? And if you're not doing that, you've got to imagine you're probably either atrophying or going in the wrong direction. If we think about it in terms of luck, hopefully you will be unlucky and never have to express your true courage or heroism, right? Like hopefully there will never have to be another invasion of Normandy. Hopefully there won't have to be another major civil rights movement or, or whatever. Hopefully we don't need these things. And so therefore the moment of being a, an Englishman or Englishwoman during the Blitz will not, will not be required of us. Hopefully our future generations will not have to live through something like the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. But if it did happen and it does tend to happen, what have you done in the way of preparation. There's a reason that troops are sent through drills and war games, and they have to keep in good physical condition. There's a reason that uh, firefighters trained over and over and over again for exactly the kind of thing that happened on 9-11. And that's why, despite the immense terror and uncertainty and chaos of that moment, so many brave men and women did their jobs. And there's actually an FDNY like sort of slogan that's in a lot of firehouses. And it says, let no man's ghost return and say, my training let me down. Mm. So I think if we're thinking about quantification, we should be thinking more in the, maybe it's more in the realm of preparation. What are you doing day in and day out to build the muscle to to prepare you for a lucky or unlucky moment where, you know, sort of real bravery is required. Mm. 
And to the extent that preparation is the daily work, you write in your book about how courage is a habit. Yeah. Well, when we're talking about, you know, more often than not, what are you doing? It's again, do you want to be the person who you worked your way up through the company, never rocking the boat, never speaking up, never proposing anything, even the slightest bit risky, always being conservative, always staying on your boss's good side. And then when you is your view that suddenly when thrust into a position of power influence, you're going to flip a switch and be the sort of bold visionary that you expressed absolutely zero hints of possessing? Probably not. And I think this is really the problem. We wonder why, you know, leaders or or executives or even politicians struggle to do the obvious right thing. It's because they didn't get where they are by doing that. They got there by doing the exact opposite. You do have to make it a habit within reason, right? You think about someone like Tim Cook who succeeds Steve Jobs. Now, if Tim Cook was a bold visionary, a transgressive leader, like in the mold of Steve Jobs, probably he and Steve Jobs wouldn't have gotten along very well and he would not have ever been in a position to be the next CEO. So it's a tension. But if you have become a sort of a risk averse bureaucrat inside your company, when you do and you tell yourself, oh, it's because I don't have any power and any influence. Well, what's going to happen when you do have those things? Are you, are you going to magically transform? That doesn't tend to be what happens. We'll come back to this episode after this word from our sponsors. Are you a content creator who is eager to start conversations about the world of work? and who thrives on building a community. You know what? In the early days of Afford Anything, there was all this excitement that I felt about connecting with this community and having conversations that matter, having conversations that make a difference, having, frankly, the types of conversations that you can't really have with a whole lot of other people because everyone else in your, like, real life, your, your default IRL world's life, thinks you're nuts. If you have the types of conversations that you have when you're inside of the Afford Anything community, the financial independence community. Well, so anyway, it's super cool to build a community and to have these amazing conversations. LinkedIn wants to give you the tools and a place to spark productive conversations in their new Creator Accelerator program. The LinkedIn Creator Accelerator program is a 10-week initiative designed to invest in creators. Accepted participants will receive personal attention from a dedicated creator manager and in-depth training. They'll have the opportunity for increased exposure across the platform, access to new LinkedIn tools, and to top it off, a $15,000 grant to bring their vision to life. Can, can I repeat that? A $15,000 grant? Okay, yeah, cool. So apply, join us, and create more than content, create conversation. Visit linkedin.com slash creators to apply today. There's a reason over 27,000 companies use NetSuite by Oracle. You get one dashboard that allows you to see all the data you need to make financial decisions on a daily basis. Think about how much time you spend going from screen to screen to screen. Like, Wouldn't you want to consolidate everything onto one dashboard? All the data, one dashboard. Think about that for a second. NetSuite gives you the ability to view and track your financials, your inventory, your HR, your e-commerce, and more all in one place. They've got this amazing white paper. You know, the white paper they wrote, it's free. You can download it for free. It's aimed at CFOs, but really it's good for anyone. So no matter what your official role is in your company, this thing is totally worth reading. You can learn about NetSuite. So NetSuite lets you automate processes, which free you up to focus on business growth. You're not manually managing a business. You're not spending hours searching for information, using multiple programs, dealing with integration glitches. And so this white paper will tell you way more. So head to netsuite.com slash Paula right now to get their free white paper, Secrets of Rockstar CFOs. That's netsuite.com slash Paula. Net, S-E-Y-T-E, dot com slash Paula, P-A-U-L-A, you can download this white paper for free. One of the precursors to everything that we're discussing is recognizing that you have agency. Can you talk about how, how and why that matters? Well, it's a fun tension because the Stoics say that our key task in life is to determine what's in our control and what's out of our control. And the reality is a vast majority of things are outside of our control. But that we can take this too far. We can start to believe that everything is systemic, everything is bigger than us, 
that it's all about averages and odds. But of course, if everyone believed that an individual couldn't make a difference, that would become effectively true. So agency is the belief that you can control your destiny to a certain extent, that you can change things, that new things can be invented, that new things can be made. There was a, an interviewer who was speaking with Charles de Gaulle, the, the leader of the Free French, and he said, you know, weren't you in a minority in all the things that you did? And he said, yes, but I knew that one day that would cease to be so. And I don't think he thought that just magically everyone would change their mind and come over to his side. I think he believed that he had the power to convince people, to to will into existence the future that he wanted to live in. This is really important. If you don't think that you have a chance, if you don't think it can be done, you're right in that you will not be the one who does it and it may not get done. Now, of course, just because you believe you can do something doesn't mean you can. But I think this idea of agency is really the belief in our own power and ability, talent and skill to direct uh, the course of our lives. It takes courage to believe that. It's easier to be cynical. Mm. It's easier to say it's rigged. I don't have a chance. It's not my fault. It's hopeless. It's sadder, but it's easier Because then you don't have to do anything. You have an excuse for why you don't have to do anything. If we find ourselves succumbing to those thoughts, how do we pull out of it? I think this goes back to the idea of heroes. Look at the individuals who have made a difference. Look at the people who had it much harder than you. Look at what they were able to accomplish. Look at your own life. Look at people who were at the same crossroads as you were, whether it was in college or before that people you grew up with, people you have been in relationships with, look at people who weighed the same amount as you, and now you've lost weight and they haven't. It's not hopeless. Your life is a testament to the power of agency. This is also goes to the idea of averages, right? You know, sometimes we'll go, oh, it's hopeless. The odds are, are stacked against it. I'm reading a book about the New England Patriots. When the New England Patriots were down 28 to 3 in the Super Bowl against the Atlanta Falcons, the probability of them winning the game was something like 99.6%. It was 99 to 1 odds that they could not win. And yet we do know what happened. They did win. They, they pulled off one of the most astounding comebacks in the history of sports. The point being, people defy the odds all the time. You have defied the odds you know, many times in your life. The fact that you are alive, that life exists on this planet, is the most unlikely thing to have ever happened. Mm. And so when we think about agency, it's important to look at the demonstrable historical record of individuals and ourselves. And remember that this thing isn't sewed up. This thing isn't totally outside of our control. And that uh, people who believe they can make a difference are the only people who end up making a difference. We've talked a bit about heroism, but we haven't elaborated on it. What is a hero? Well, if fear is the first battle, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm afraid I don't want to do it. Courage is, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take the risk. Heroism is something at a higher level. So one of the examples I use in the book, I I think this is a good way of seeing the distinction. When Michael Jordan leaves basketball, he's the greatest basketball player in the world, perhaps the greatest of all time. He walks away from from basketball at the height of his career to play baseball. What he wanted to do, uh, what he thought would be a fun challenge. And you can imagine that everyone in his life told him this is a terrible idea, right? Mm. It's too risky. You'll never make it. Athletes don't do this. Think of all the money that will cost you. And he did it. And he played. He was good. He ends up coming back to basketball. We know the end of that story. But it takes courage to have done that. Courage and and bravery to have defied the odds, defied expectations and criticism to, to pursue what he wanted to pursue. Mm-hmm. Heroism, though, there's nothing particularly heroic about it. He was doing it for himself. He wanted to play a different sport, and he used his power, talent, and resources to pursue that. Mm. But what about uh, a few seasons ago 
when Maya Moore, the equally dominant basketball player in the WNBA, walks away at the height of her career. She takes a year off, and then now I think it's been two years, to help free a man from prison who had been wrongly convicted. Mm -hmm. That's heroic because what she is doing is taking all the same risks as Michael Jordan, but it's not for her. She's not getting anything out of it. I mean, she feels obligated to do it. It's the right thing to do. But to me, this is a, a higher plane of courage because we're risking something for someone else. Mm. One of the correlated concepts with heroism is the notion of valor. What is it? Valor to me is, is another way of expressing this kind of heroism where you, you, you're willing to die for a principle. You're willing to give everything that there is. And, you know, it's interesting, right? Whenever you watch or read about one of these kids or often kids who are, you know, getting the Medal of Honor or something, you know, they go, I, or, or somebody who, you know, jumped in front of a train and saved someone from a train track or whatever, they go, I just did what anyone would have done. Mm. And it's we know that's not true or we wouldn't have medals, right? Like if this was actually common, it wouldn't be special. And it's precisely because it's so rare that we we recognize it and we celebrate it, hopefully to inspire other people to follow in their footsteps. But yeah, the, this idea of of really putting yourself out there when the primary beneficiary of what you're doing is not yourself. I, I talk a little bit about the decision that CVS made several years ago to stop carrying cigarettes. This cost them several billion dollars annually. What's remarkable about it is that it doesn't, it not only um, reduces sales of cigarettes like at CVS by definition, but from the research, the sales of cigarettes nationwide go down because cigarettes are harder to get. So people just smoke less or cigarettes are more expensive. And so people just buy fewer of them. And so when we think about what does CVS get out of this, like nothing, right? CVS gets nothing. They just didn't want to be that company. And again, when we talk about heroes, that's something that we shouldn't just go, why don't more companies do stuff like that? To me, the question is, well, what sacrifices have I made in my business or my career, my industry, for which the primary beneficiary was not me? Would it be accurate to say that valor is the concept and the hero is the individual or entity? I think that, that sounds right. I like that. And so how do you know, since sometimes your own motivations may elude you, how do you know if a particular act of courage is in service to someone else or somebody besides yourself or not? It can be easy to deceive yourself. Oh, totally. When we talk about heroism, what we're really talking about is this idea of selflessness. I think about my grandfather who landed at Normandy. When he enlists, they were like, hey, you're going to be gone for an indefinite amount of time. You're going to not know the odds of survival are decent, but not guaranteed. And he said, all right, sign me up. So heroism is when we risk something and we risk that thing and the primary beneficiary is what the Stokes refer to as the common good, right? Other people, the whole, your children, society. What are you risking? And is the payoff there for humanity as a collective? Or are you not willing to risk it because you don't want to be possibly disadvantaged or imposed on in some way. And that relates back to the concept that you talked about at the beginning of this conversation, which is that courage is the first of four mm -hmm. with justice and self-discipline and wisdom being the other three. Yeah. And as I think self-discipline is a really interesting, underrated virtue because let's say you are willing to quit your job to go start a business. Is it courageous to do it the day you have the idea? Or does it require some courage to plan and save and prepare, right? So, so the idea for me of self-discipline is like, what is the right amount? What is the timing? 
Can you hold your fire till the absolute right moment? Can you pick the right cause? All these virtues are very related to each other and, again, difficult to separate from each other. There is no, you know, courage doesn't matter if it's not in the pursuit of justice. You need wisdom to know what the just cause is, but you need self-discipline to know what the right amount of courage is and how to apply it and when, you know, when to apply it. They're difficult to separate for sure. And they're, they don't exist as parlor tricks, right? You know, a really self-disciplined person whose self-discipline is merely applied to doing lots of sit-ups so they can have a perfect physique, mm-hmm. you're sort of like, well, okay, I mean, I guess it looks good, but what was the point? Would it be accurate then to say that too much courage could border on recklessness? And not only could one say that, that is what Aristotle says like 2,000 years ago. Aristotle has this concept of the golden mean, and he actually uses courage to illustrate how all virtues, he says, are a midpoint between two vices. So he says, on the one end, you have cowardice, but the opposite of cowardice is not courage. The opposite of cowardice is recklessness. And in the middle, you have courage. So I, I like that. It's it's. Uh, The virtue is like, what's the right amount? What's the right amount? Just as, you know, a lack of self-discipline is not good, but so would, you know, an addiction to working out or Mm -hmm. an eating disorder or something, right? Um, Too much discipline is also a vice. So it's about what is the moderate amount, you know, nothing in excess, as the Greeks said. It's about getting to that that sort of perfect midpoint that's really essential. How would it work with the other two? What would be too much wisdom? I mean, certainly, you know, wisdom pursued for its own sake becomes kind of a, you know, vanity. Are you pursuing information you can actually use or are you just piling up facts and figures? So ignorance on the one end and then just loads and loads of impractical, theoretical, abstract information is not of much use either. Justice is where it it gets tricky. You know, Marx really says that there is no sort of opposite of justice in that sense. Like justice is what we're aspiring towards. But I do think mercy probably applies in there. If not compromise, the ability to get something done in real life as opposed to, you know, the impractical, perfect scenario. We, maybe that's where we start to find justice, uh, you know, needs a moderating uh, influence. But I haven't written that book yet, so I, I, don't, I don't have a great answer for you yet. <laughs> we are skipping putting an ad here. We're skipping that second ad break. So I know I, know I interrupted the conversation to tell you that I'm not going to interrupt the conversation. Wah, wah. But rather than throw a couple of ads in here, I want to take a moment to be like, yo, don't forget, affordanything.com slash real estate, you can live stream with me. We're going to talk all kinds of solid information about real estate. If you have any curiosity about this, register for free. Just by registering, you'll get replays of it. You'll get this really cool PDF download. Like you'll get all kinds of really awesome stuff. It's totally free. So why not? affordanything.com slash real estate. Cool. That's all I got to say. Back to our regularly scheduled conversation with Ryan Holiday about courage and cowardice and recklessness and justice and wisdom and self-discipline. And okay, I'll stop now. Here's Ryan. It seems imprudent to have a conversation about courage, heroism, valor, without also discussing the notion of sacrifice How would you define sacrifice and how do we know it when we see it and accept when sacrifices must be made? Yeah. What are you willing to pay for this thing that you believe in, right? What are you willing to put up? It doesn't always have to be your physical safety, but it could be a hit to your reputation. It could be work. It could be commitment. It could be effort. But I I would argue that courage inherently demands sacrifice and heroism often demands what we now call the the ultimate sacrifice. 
So I think the idea that none of this is free, right? The fear is free. Not doing stuff is free, although it, it sort of can cost you spiritually in the end. But the idea that like you have to risk something, you have to pay something, you have to put something on the line, that is what courage is about. Like I was saying earlier, if it was guaranteed, if you knew as a foregone conclusion that it would work out, you're talking about a situation that courage doesn't pertain to. The whole point is that we don't know. We don't know. It could go either way. It could work, could not work, but you're willing to try. And we need, we need people who are willing to try. You know, we need more people who are willing to try, especially on the problems that seem impossible or unwinnable. Or, you know, we have that expression, no good deed goes unpunished. Like, mm -hmm. we need people who are like, I don't care. People who are willing to accept the punishment in order to do what's right, what's principled. Yeah, because where would we be without those people? I think if you, that, that's a good test as far as courage goes. Like, what would the world look like if everyone accepted the excuse that I'm about to accept? Ah, but I could lose in the primaries. Or, ah, I've got young kids. Or, ah, I don't like the spotlight. Or, ah, you know, our opponents, you know, are too big. No one wants to hear this. You know, the, the cause is not popular. Where would we be if everyone had accepted that excuse? All the progress we've made as a society, as a species, has come from people who had the courage. Um, in some cases, people who heroically you know, gave everything in opposition to that kind of resignation. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Where can people find you if they would like to know more about you or your work? Oh, yeah. Well, thanks. It's always good to talk. You can check out my stuff at ryanholiday.net. And then I send out an email every day, totally for free, about Stoic philosophy and these four virtues at dailystoic.com. Thank you so much, Ryan. What are some of the key takeaways that we got from this conversation? Here are five. Key takeaway number one. Ryan explained the concept of four inextricable cardinal virtues that anchor Stoic philosophy. Courage, self-discipline, justice, and wisdom. These four virtues cannot be separated. There is no such thing as courage absent of wisdom, for one needs the wisdom to know that it is being done for a just cause, and one needs the self-discipline to know that you are remaining balanced. You haven't tipped the scales too far over to the side of cowardice, nor have you tipped the scales too far over to the side of recklessness. Courage is the first virtue, but the next virtue is self-discipline, and the third virtue is justice, and the fourth virtue is wisdom. And the point is, all of these virtues fit inextricably with each other. They're difficult to separate. So, you know, we're talking about courage, and we can really talk about what courage looks like and what it means. But it's impossible to separate courage from wisdom, which goes to your question is, how do I know I'm being courageous? And then it's, that's impossible to separate from justice, which is, how do I know that I'm being courageous about the right thing? And then the, the final part is, how do I know that I'm expressing the right amount of courage, not too much, not too little? And so this is really a difficult challenge to do. But it's why we have to be thinking about it consciously. We can't just sort of, oh, I'm just going to trust my gut on this. And so the first key takeaway is that these four virtues embody separate concepts, but none can exist or live without one another. They are interdependent. And so if we want to exhibit any one of these virtues within our lives, in our careers, in the businesses that we run, in the investment choices that we make in the way that we show up as landlords, as side hustlers, as small business owners, if we want to show any one of these four virtues in the way that we approach that work, then we need all of them. That is the first key takeaway. Key takeaway number two, don't trust your gut because sometimes your gut is a coward. Sometimes your gut doesn't want to do the thing that's uncomfortable and that reptilian part of you, the part that seeks safety 
and comfort and familiarity, the part that loves the status quo, sometimes your gut reflects that and you hesitate. And so sometimes that feeling of hesitation is something that you should ignore, not always. And that's why this takeaway isn't to rebel against your gut, it's simply not to trust your gut. Because every now and again, your gut isn't aligned with your moral principles. Is this a hard and fast rule you should only do what you felt a hesitation to do? No, because sometimes the hesitation is what's saving you from needlessly plunging off a cliff. But I do think this idea of, okay, the things that we're afraid of, we're often afraid of them because there's that voice in our head that's saying, well, what about this? And what about this? And do you really want to get into this? And that's, that is the voice of cowardice in our head that we need to sort of push through or power through. And so what's better than trusting your gut is trusting your principles. Let your principles be your North Star. That is the second key takeaway. Key takeaway number three, courage requires that you pay a certain cost or you accept a certain level of risk. If there's no risk, then it doesn't actually require anything of you. Now let's take this concept and let's apply it to investing. Let's apply it to buying a rental property. Let's apply it to foraying into the stock market for the first time. Or maybe, maybe, if it's right for your asset allocation, taking on a small, reasonable exposure to cryptocurrencies, which is something that maybe five years ago you never would have considered. All of those acts, those acts of investing, those require a degree of courage. If there was no risk, then everyone would do it. And if there was no risk, then there would be no potential reward. The same holds true when you decide to leave your career and switch to a more fulfilling but potentially lower paying or more volatile career. The same holds true when you decide to start a side hustle, despite the fact that you don't know where you're going to find the time to do it. Or when you decide to quit your nine to five and make your side hustle your full-time career. All of these things require that you pay a certain cost, that you take a certain level of risk, that you become a bigger person, a more self-actualized person than you were a year ago. To not do something because you're afraid of it costing you money is a really bad reason. In fact, there's a great expression I love that says, um, it's not a principle if it doesn't cost you money. Right. So like when we think about courage, if it wasn't scary, if the outcome was obvious, like if Theodore Roosevelt knew for certain that it wouldn't cost him the election, that it would age well historically, that it wouldn't cause a bunch of drama or difficulty. If starting the business was a guarantee, if success was guaranteed, well, then it wouldn't require courage. And doing it wouldn't be courageous. So the fact that these things are scary or hard, there's a show my son likes. And they have this song where they talk about you have to be scared to be brave. And I remember hearing that as I was writing the book and thinking that's actually very well said, right? Like if you're not scared, if it was obvious, um, if there was no risk involved, then bravery is just not a part of this equation. And so courage demands a cost. That is the third key takeaway. Key takeaway number four, acts of courage relate to your ability to do your duty. It is not, you know, oftentimes people will throw around little jabs or little dares when you decline to do something that's just pointless and dumb. Oh, you're not going to eat that hot sauce? What are you, weak? Like, I do it too. It's how we tease our friends. But... (sighs) In all seriousness, if something is pointless and dumb, you don't have to do it. Ryan Holiday gives the example of he doesn't like roller coasters. He just doesn't like them. And so if he decides not to ride a roller coaster, that's not cowardice because he doesn't have to do that in order to do his duty to his society, to his family, to his colleagues, to his friends. He's not letting anybody down if he declines to ride a roller coaster. It doesn't matter. But if an act of moral cowardice, for example, if a hesitancy to have a difficult conversation, a necessary 
but difficult conversation, if an act of moral cowardice like that curtails you from doing your duty as a member of society, as a neighbor, as a family member, as a friend, as a colleague, as an investor, as either a citizen or a resident, that is where the conversation around these cardinal virtues come into play. I don't enjoy the sensation of, you know, my stomach dropping, so I don't seek out roller coasters. That's that's not cowardice. But let's say I was writing this book or one of my other books and I was pulling my punches. I wasn't saying what I really thought because I didn't want to offend people or I was not sharing things that I knew or felt because I was worried what someone might think or um, I was trying to present myself a certain way. That would be cowardice, right? Because my duty, my job as an author is to put myself out there. The, the, the job of the book is to be the expression of what I think and feel. And so if out of cowardice, I fail, if out of fear, I fail to do that, then we would call that cowardice. And so cowardice is not declining to do something that's pointless and dumb. Cowardice is failing to do your duty. That's key takeaway number four. Finally, key takeaway number five. These four cardinal virtues, cowardice, justice, wisdom, and self-discipline, are not extremes. They all exist in the middle. Courage, for example, is the midpoint between cowardice and recklessness. And that's a bit of an eye-opener because oftentimes people forget the far end of the extreme. People will paint courage as the opposite of cowardice and portray it as a far extreme end. It is actually a midpoint. It is a point that requires an artful balance. Aristotle has this concept of the golden mean, and he actually uses courage to illustrate how all virtues, he says, are a midpoint between two vices. So he says, on the one end, you have cowardice, but the opposite of cowardice is not courage. The opposite of cowardice is recklessness. And in the middle, you have courage. And so these four concepts Courage, self-discipline, justice, and wisdom are the middle way. That is the fifth and final key takeaway from this conversation with Stoic philosopher Ryan Holiday. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'd love to invite you to any one or all of the live streams, the virtual live streams that I am doing in the next two weeks. The first two weeks of October 2021, I'll be hosting three live streams, one on what to do if you live in a high cost of living area and you'd like to invest in real estate, but everything in your city is expensive. That's what one of them is going to be about. Another is going to be about the year 2021. The housing market's kind of bonkers. Is this a good time to start? So I'm going to do a live stream on that. I'll be taking live audience Q&A. And then finally, how does real estate investing fit into your financial independence timeline? I'll be doing a live stream on that as well. You can sign up for any one of those or all of those at affordanything.com slash real estate, completely free. And if you can't attend live by signing up at that link, you won't miss getting the recording of the event after it's happened. You'll also get some freebies, some goodies to help you figure out if real estate investing is right for you. So again, all of that is at affordanything.com slash real estate. I also have a course that I offer only twice a year. The last time it was open for enrollment was back in April, and it's reopened again just for the next two weeks. So October 4th through 14th, it's actually fewer than two weeks, it's 10 days, October 4th through 14th, 2021, it will reopen for enrollment. After that, we shut our doors, and our doors are going to be closed until spring of next year. It is a 10-week long, high-touch course. We give you lots and lots and lots of support, and we teach you A through Z, everything that you need to know to go forth in the world as a confident real estate investor. You also have lifetime access to the course. So if you can't complete it now, or if you can start it now, but you can't get through the whole thing, that's fine. We've got many students who come back whenever is convenient for them. Once you are in, you are a student for life. 
So if you want more information on that, go to affordanything.com slash VIP list. That's affordanything.com slash VIP list. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Paula Pant. This is the Afford Anything Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or a family member. And I'll catch you in the next episode. Take care.